few questions. Is this out of the picture if I put it here? Great. Yeah. What we're hoping to do in this whole series is look at this technology. Why is a computer so interesting? So I'm going to start that way. Okay. So what is it, what's different about this machine? Excuse me, I have one, one quick request. Yep. And that is don't throw your fingers in front of that mic because that's, that's what I'm picking you up. All right, you're on. <laughs> By the way, the next time uh, when you do an interview at the factory, that place that we found, mm -hmm. probably the best location. Uh, we found a way to, to boost you up enough uh -huh. so you're over the rail uh -huh. and you can see the, the, the two armed robot. Yeah. Great. So nice shot. Okay. Do we have speed? Yeah. Okay. What is it about this machine? Why is this machine so interesting? Why has it been so influential? Uh, um, I'll give you my point of view on it. Uh, I remember reading a magazine article a long time ago, uh, when I was uh, 12 years old maybe, in, I think it was Scientific American, I'm not sure. And the article um, proposed to measure the efficiency of locomotion for uh, lots of species on planet Earth to see which species was the most efficient at getting from point A to point B. Uh, and they measured the kilocalories that each one expended. So uh, they ranked them all. And I remember that uh, uh, the condor won. The condor was the most efficient at <coughs> getting from point A to point B. And humankind, the, the crown of creation, came in with a rather unimpressive showing about a third of the way down the list. So uh, that didn't look so great. But uh, let me do this over again because I'm just sure. can say this better. Hmm. <coughs> I remember uh, reading an article when I was about 12 years old, I think it might have been in Scientific American, where they measured the efficiency of locomotion for all these species on planet Earth. Uh, how many kilocalories did they expend to get from point A to point B? And the condor one uh, came in at the top of the list, uh, surpassed everything else, and humans came in about a third of the way down the list, which was not such a great showing for the crown of creation. And, uh, but somebody there had the imagination to test the efficiency of a human riding a bicycle. Human riding a bicycle blew away the condor, all the way off the top of the list. And it, it made a really big impression on me that we humans are tool builders, and that we can fashion tools that amplify these inherent abilities that we have to spectacular magnitudes. And so for me, a computer has always been a bicycle of the mind, uh, something that, that takes us far beyond our inherent abilities. And uh, I think we're just at the early stages of this tool, very early stages, and we've come only a very short distance, and it's still in its formation, but already we've seen enormous changes. I think that's nothing compared to what's coming in the next hundred years. In, in program six, we're going to look at some of the past predictions of why people have been so wrong about the future. Uh -huh. And one of the notions is, is that today's vision of a standalone computer is just as limited as those past visions of it being only a number cruncher. Uh -huh. What's the difference philosophically between a network machine and a standalone machine? Um, let me answer that question in a slightly different way. <clears throat> there have been, if you look at why the majority of people have bought these things so far, uh, there have been two real explosions that have propelled the industry forward. The first one uh, really happened in 1977, and it was the spreadsheet. I remember when uh, Dan Feilstra, who ran the company that marketed the first spreadsheet, walked into my office at Apple one day and pulled out this disk from his uh, vest pocket and said, I, I have this incredible new program. I call it a visual calculator, and it became VisiCalc. And that's what really drove, propelled the Apple II to, to the success it, it achieved, more than any other single event. And, and with uh, the invention of Lotus 1, 2, 3, and I think it was 1982, that's what really propelled the IBM PC to the level of success that it achieved. So that was the first explosion, was the spreadsheet. Um, the second major explosion that's driven our, the desktop industry has been desktop publishing. Excuse me. We just lost a life. 
Get a break. Chris. Hmm. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Sorry. When is this going to be broadcast? Next year sometime? Uh, we have to tell anyone. Co-production of the BBC. Huh. And actually, one part is going to be interesting. I'm going to ask you at the end is we're going to dramatize the future, what we guess our future is, because mm -hmm. we've got a dramatic budget in England. Mm -hmm. Whatever our guess is, it's going to be wrong. Yeah. At least we want to give people a vision of where things are heading. Mm -hmm. So can I just start off with the second one? Sure. Right. The, the, the second really big explosion in our, our industry has been desktop publishing. It happened in 1985 with the Macintosh and the LaserWriter printer. And at that point, people could start to do on their desktops things that only typesetters and printers could do prior to that. And that's been a very big revolution in publishing. And those have really, those two explosions have been the only two real major revolutions which have caused mo a lot of people to buy these things and use them. Uh, the third one is starting to happen now. And the third one is, let's do for human-to-human -human communication what spreadsheets did for financial planning and what pub desktop publishing did for publishing. Let's revolutionize it using these desktop devices. And we're already starting to see the signs of that. As an example, in an organization, we're starting to see that as business conditions change faster and faster with each year, uh, we cannot change our management hierarchical organization very fast relative to the changing business conditions. We can't have somebody working for a new boss every week. We also can't change our geographic organization very fast. Matter of fact, even slower than the management one. We can't be moving people around the country every week. But we can change an electronic organization like that. And what's starting to happen is as we start to link these computers together with sophisticated networks and great user interfaces, we're starting to be able to create clusters of people working on a common task in a, you know, literally in 15 minutes worth of setup. And these 15 people can work together extremely efficiently no matter where they are geographically and no matter who they work for hierarchically. And these organizations can live for as long as they're needed and then vanish. And we're finding we can reorganize our companies electronically uh, very rapidly and that's the only type of organization that can begin to keep pace with the changing business conditions. And I believe that this collaborative model has existed in higher education for a long time, but we're starting to see it applied into the commercial world as well. And this is going to be the third major revolution that these desktop computers provide, is revolutionizing human-to-human -human communication and group work. We call it interpersonal computing. In the 1980s, we did personal computing. Uh, and now we're going to extend that as we network these things to interpersonal computing. Thinking, taking the long view now, what was the image of the computer in the mid-1960s or whenever you first saw one? Hmm. And where are we now? What was the, how did the PC enact that change? Right. I, um, I first saw my first computer when I was 12. Uh, I first saw it. I, um, I saw my first computer when I was 12, and it was at uh, NASA. We had a local NASA center nearby. And it was a terminal, which was connected to a big computer somewhere, and I got a time-sharing account on it. And I was fascinated by this thing. And I saw my second computer a few years later, which was really the first desktop computer ever made. It was made by Hewlett Packard. It's called the 9100A, and it ran a language called BASIC. And it was very large, uh, had a very small cathode ray tube on it for display. And I got a chance to play with one of those maybe in 1968 or 9 and uh, spent every spare moment I had trying to write programs for it. I was so fascinated by this. Uh, and so I was probably fairly lucky in that my introduction to computers very rapidly moved from a terminal uh, to within maybe 12 months or so actually seeing a, the, one of the first, probably the first desktop computer ever ever really produ produced. And uh, so my point of view never really changed from, from being able to get my arms around it, even though my arms probably didn't quite fit around that first one. So. What was the role, how have personal computers changed the, the landscape of, of computers? I mean, back then it was centralized power, it was in a mainframe, now we have three times as much power at the fringe than we have in the center, mm -hmm. or five times as much power that affected that. I'm not the right person to ask. Okay. 
Um, Ask Alan Kay. <laughs> Uh, we have just about covered. The only other thought I have is um, when you were getting started out, I, I read somewhere that you had no intention of building a company. Mm -hmm. that you were just out to do stuff for yourselves. If you can give me. Right. I don't know what the question they asked to get that, but. Well, at the time we started Apple. Um, Waz was working for Hewlett Packard. I was working for Atari, actually, for Nolan Bushnell, designing video games. And uh, we, we went to Atari and showed them our early prototypes, and we went to HP. And we encouraged each company to hire the other one and let us do this for them. And we got, we got turned down in both places, probably for good reasons. But uh, we started a company because it was the only alternative left, not because we wanted to. When did you ever think that it was gonna this was really going to happen, that this was going to go from just a, an interesting idea to, to... Oh, it didn't take very long. It, it happened for me when I saw people that could never possibly design a computer, could never possibly build a hardware kit, could never possibly assemble their own keyboards and monitors, could never even write their own software using these things. Then you knew something very big was going to happen. When we got into that stage, where we were high enough on the food chain, if you will, that uh, a lot of people could use these things, and they were really liking it. What's the the goal of the the, the next factory? What? Why is it so automated? Why is that necessary? Um, One could go on for a long time about how the U.S. has forgotten about manufacturing, which has certainly been true, but we're starting to wake up. And uh, what we're finding is, is that uh, time to market is very important and quality is very important. And the way we can make tremendous uh, increase in quality and, and reductions in time to market is through automation. So the automation isn't there to lower the cost, although it does do that. It's really there to increase the quality and decrease the time it takes us to get our new product as an example to market, which is very important in a technology-based marketplace. So um, we happen to be the lowest cost producer in the world already at Next of our class of products. We also happen to be one of the highest quality producers of our type of product in the world. And we think for a company to survive much less prosper in the 90s, that these are going to be very, very important things to be world class at. Uh, we're not competing at the Homebrew Computer Society anymore. We're competing with Europe Inc. and Japan Inc. and IBM Inc. Uh, and uh, in order to do that, we really have to be world class manufacturers. What a computer, I'm dancing around a bit, just picking up the, the stray ends here. So if they're, they're not very connected, excuse me. What do computer networks offer to education? Well, uh, you know, education's been on computer networks for longer than almost anyone else. Uh, the Department of Defense uh, has an office called DARPA, and they funded a thing called uh, ARPANET many, many years ago uh, to try to build a command and control network for military uh, uh, purposes and they did a very brilliant thing after they got a prototype working they gave it to the university community in America and said bang on this for a while and see if it works and m help us make it better and after a few years of the university community doing that they created a separate version uh, for military purposes but they left the uh, educational version going and that is tied together the research community of the United States now for about a decade and uh, is vital to the functioning of higher education in this country. Uh, so higher education has actually led the way. That's why we started off focusing exclusively on higher education, because where else could you find 5,000 people on a network but Carnegie Mellon University, as an example. So higher education has been five years ahead of business in using computers in some of these powerful new ways, which we're going to see now ripple into business in the first half of the 90s. It's pretty exciting. How about lower education? How about school? How about lower um, sharing valuable resources. So far, uh, computer use in K through 12 has been primarily Apple IIs, and uh, I wish uh, I wish that uh, they'd been upgrading to Macintoshes faster than they have been. But I think uh, I think that that's slowly happening, and 
IBM is, is getting in there as well. The primary purpose of computing in K through 12 has been just computer literacy. And um, there's been a bottleneck because there hasn't been enough sophisticated courseware written. And that's a problem for our society in general amongst all the other problems with our K through 12 education system. One could talk about that for a few days. Easily. So, <laughs> Easily. That's, uh, Were you down in Austin to see Bob? Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. And was going to go speak with Jack Kilby. Unfortunately, he's he's in the hospital. Ooh. Uh, I think he's I think he's fine. I think he's back. Um. Going back to the Mac. In meeting the deadline for the Mac, how crazy did it get? I mean, you'd already said that you were going to have this big splash of the Super Bowl. Um, actually, we'd wanted to get the Mac out a year before we did. So we had internal deadlines uh, that we were not able to meet. But by the time we set, uh, by the time we bought the spots for the Super Bowl and things like that, I mean, it was basically in the bag. It's not that we didn't work 24 hours a day for the last six months to get it out. But um, we were on the bomb run at that time. I, I love this, this, I don't want to call it a gesture, this thing that you did, which is have everybody sign the cases. That was yeah. great. What was the, well, why did you do that? Um, because the people that worked on it consider themselves, and I certainly consider them, artists. These are the people that under, under different circumstances would be painters and poets, but because of the, that time that we live in, this new medium has appeared uh, in which to express oneself to one's fellow species, and that's a medium of computing. And um, so a lot of people that would have been artists and scientists have gone into this field uh, to express their, their feeling. And um, so it, it seemed like a, the right thing to do. What was it like when you announced at the shareholders meeting? Oh, wow. It was, uh, well, I got the, the first few rows had all the people that worked on the Mac, about 100 people, 150 people that really made it happen. Uh, we're all seated in the first few rows. And when, when it was introduced, uh, after we went through it all and had the computer speak to people itself and things like that, uh, the whole auditorium of about 2,500 people gave it a standing ovation. And uh, uh, the whole first few rows of Mac folks were all just crying. Every, all of us were just, I was biting my tongue very hard because I had a little bit more to do. But... Uh, it was a very, very emotional moment because it was no longer ours. From that day forward, it was no longer ours. We couldn't change it. If we had a good idea the following day, it was too late. It, was, it belonged to the world at that point in time. I should probably get going. Yeah, yeah, I'm just thinking a, a couple, but let's do the kickers then. Okay, these are the, the 15 seconds at the beginning of the show to grab people's attention. So, program three, we're going from semiconductors to the, uh, to the growth and the establishment of the computer industry. Uh -huh. So what did you accomplish? What did you set out to do and what did you do? Well, I think maybe something different along the lines of what you want is, um, you know, the, the semiconductor people didn't know what they had in the microprocessor for two or three years. It was the computer hobbyists that really got the idea to make this into a computer rather than a calculator. We got to build a com company or change the world? Uh, when we started Apple, we were out to build computers for our friends. That was all. No idea of a company. How important is a user interface in the design of a computer? Turn that into your own words. Well, the whole idea of the Macintosh was a computer for people who want to use a computer rather than learn how to use a computer. So, One way we've been playing with it is it's not how it does it, but what it does. I don't know if that's any good. In other words, I don't care how it does it anymore. I just right. wanted to do what I wanted to do. Right. There's a quote in uh, an interview that was done with me in Playboy a while ago where I... I uh, 
I gave a Macintosh to a young kid one time. It was um, actually Sean Lennon at his birthday. And uh, he had a great quote. He said, uh, he said, everyone else, and I guess I said this, actually. <laughs> Oh, I think I remember. This is right. the older people and younger people. Yeah, right. right. The older people all want to know how it does what it does, but the young people just want to know what it can do. Okay, wrap that up in two. Um, is you, the, 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 the gra graphical interface or the, 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 trans, the, the line that we're going, how about this? Where are we in the evolution of the user interface, and where are we going? Is that a short one? Um, I don't know that there is a short one, but yeah. I, th this whole discussion about user interface is just strange to me because to me it's just sort of a natural thing that had to happen, did happen, and it's happened. It's kind of like automatic transmissions. Um, well, in a history quite, series, not quite though, the same as that, but in a history series, though, there is an, uh, an evolutionary line, so that's why we're following. Uh -huh. I mean, a lot of people don't know about Doug Engelbart, right? For example. Right. Um, okay, uh, networking. Why is networking important? Why is it the future? Well, in the 90s, we're going to revolutionize human to human communication using these desktop computers in the same way that spreadsheets revolutionized financial modeling and that desktop publishing revolutionized publishing. Great. Okay, good. Anything Thanks. we haven't covered? No, I got to go. This is great. Thank, Thank you very much. Three times as much power at the fringe than we have in the center, mm -hmm. or five times as much power to dependent with statistics. Well, what, how did the PC change the world? Well, though the analogy is nowhere perfect, um, and, and certainly uh, one needs to factor out the environmental concerns of the, of the analogy as well, uh, there is a lot to be said for comparing it to going from trains, from passenger trains to automobiles. And uh, the advent of the automobile gave us a personal freedom of transportation. In the same way, uh, the advent of the computer gave us the ability to start to use computers without having to convince other people that we needed to use computers. And the biggest effect of the personal computer revolution has been to um, allow millions and millions of people to experience computers themselves uh, decades before they ever would have in the old paradigm and to allow them to uh, participate in uh, the making of choices and controlling their own destiny using these tools. But it has created, uh, it has created problems. And the largest problems are that uh, now that we have all these very powerful tools, we're still islands and we're still not really connecting these people using these powerful tools together. And that's really been the challenge of the last few years and the next several years, is how to connect these things back together so that we can, can rebuild a fabric of these things rather than just individual points of light, if you will, and um, get the benefit of both the passenger train and the automobile. So. Mm -hmm. What's the vision behind the next machine? We've already covered this a little bit. But. Yeah. The, Everything that uh, that we've done in our well, what's the right way to say this? Everything I've done with computers in my life has been along pretty much a single vector, uh, and and next is is just one more point on that same vector. Uh, in this case, what we we observed was that the computing power we could give to an individual was an order of magnitude more than the PCs were giving. Uh, in the sense that people want to do many things at once and you really need true multitasking. We really did want to um, start to network these things together in very sophisticated networks so the technology to build that in became available. And most important, we saw a way to build a software system that was about ten times as powerful than any PC and where so new software could be created in a fourth of the time. So. We spent four years with uh, 50 to 100 of the best software people we could find building this new software system. 
and it's turned out beautifully. What's the vision behind Next? Um, it's not so much different than everything I've ever done in my life with computers, I'm starting with the Apple II and Macintosh and, and now Next, which is if you uh, believe that these are the most incredible tools we've ever built, which I do, then the more powerful tool we can give to people, the more they can do with it. And in this case, uh, we, f we found a way to do two or three things that were real breakthroughs. Number one was to put a much more powerful computer in front of people for about the same price as a PC. The second was to integrate that networking into the computer so we can begin to make this next revolution with interpersonal computing. And, and the PCs so far have not been able to do that very well. And the third thing, and maybe the most important, was to create a whole new software architecture from the ground up that lets us build these new types of applications and lets, them, let us, lets us build them in 25% of the time that it normally takes to do on a PC. So uh, we spent uh, four years with 50 to 100 of the best software people that I know creating a whole new software platform from the ground up. And the way our industry works is that you create this platform software first, and then you go out and you get people to write new applications on top of it. Well, the, the height that these new applications can soar is, is enabled or limited by the platform software. And there's only been three systems that have ever been successful in the whole history of desktop computing. That was the Apple II's platform software, of which there wasn't too much, uh, the IBM PC, and Macintosh. So we're attempting to create the fourth platform software standard and hopefully will succeed because it will allow these applications to be written which far, far exceed in capacity what can be done in today's machines. Okay. Based. Uh -huh. What happens when you have a network that allows the min relative minorities in a whole different area come together? How does that change the democracy? I don't know. Okay. But, but what I have seen is I've seen interpersonal computing happening at our own company. Uh, maybe the best way to put it is, um, I remember when the first spreadsheet came out, I saw it fly through Apple as well as other companies. And when we, uh, when we invented desktop publishing, of course, it influenced Apple first. And I've seen the same thing happen with interpersonal computing here at Next. We decided to put a Next machine on every employee's desktop about 18 months ago and connect them with you know, the very high-speed networking that's built in. And I've seen the revolution here with my own eyes and it, it's actually larger than the first two. Let me give you some examples. Uh, if we want to, uh, if we're going to be doing uh, a special project, let's say with a company, and we, and let's say the company's called, um, what's your, what's your? WGBH. T J WGBH. We're going to do, be doing a special project with WGBH, and what we'll do is we'll create a, a special mailbox WGBH, and we'll put 20 people on it that are going to be helping on this project. Now, these 20 people will be from all over our company, from marketing, from sales, from engineering, uh, some from manufacturing, maybe some from our Boston office so they can be close by. And uh, if one sends a message to this mailbox, they'll all get it like that instantly. And if uh, one sends a reply, they'll copy the whole mailbox on it so the rest of the, the team members get to read. Uh, the intellectual content going back and forth. And everyone on this, in this uh, mailbox will probably get around 30 mail messages a day. And they'll spend about 20 minutes, 30 minutes reading these and answering these per day. And it'll be like a beehive. Now, I, this project's very important for our company, and I want to make sure it's getting off right. So I'll put my own name on this mailbox, and I'll see these 30 mail messages fly by, all of the disagreements and the arguments and the thoughts and the decisions. And I can just let it fly by and read it, I can do some background coaching with a few people if I think they're a little off track. I can get right on the network in kibitz if I'd like. Uh, and after a month or so when I know that it's going well, I can take my name off. And so not only is this a way to organize violating all management and geographic boundaries, it's also a way to manage where one can see, again, the thoughts and disagreements and decisions of a company fly by a manager in a way that they never could before. And uh, we have seen it reduce the number of meetings we have at least by 50%. We've seen it get far more managers and individual contributors involved in decisions than they ever were before. And we think the quality of the decisions is a lot higher. And we've seen a window for management to look into the, to the process of this organism we call our company in a way that has never before been possible. 
I'm part of this electronically connected community. Um, that's going to provide us wonderful new capabilities and, and uh, communications abilities, but we still always want to be able to disconnect that network spigot, take it off, and take our standalone computer somewhere, let's say home. Now, what's going to happen rapidly is with radio links and with fiber optics to the home, you're going to be able to hook your computer up to your network at home. Uh, but there's always going to be that cabin in the middle of nowhere that I want to go for a two-week vacation where I want my computer. And if it doesn't work in a completely standalone way, I'm, I'm going to be not happy. So we have to provide a fluid way for these things to kind of dock into the mother load network, but also undock and allow me as an individual to carry my computer up into Yosemite backpacking and where there's you know, no radio links and no fiber into the network and find out what happened when I left and share some of my thoughts maybe with some other folks. So we're working on that. That's our goal for the next five years is that seamless transition between the standalone computer and the computer as part of this network community. It also keeps away the Orwellian aspects of always being hooked into the network. Right. That's right. Um, now, I actually think what, what an interesting paradox is it is the network which is ultimately going to define and create the home computer market, not keeping our recipes on these things or something like we thought in 1975. Uh, being a part of that network and not being able to stay away from it while you're at home will drive people to get uh, computers in every house, just like we have a telephone in every house. But computers then won't be just computers. They'll be radios and stereos and TVs. No, I think, I think they'll be just computers, just like your phone isn't your television set, um, just like your toaster isn't your radio. Uh, I think they'll be computers, and they'll have many of the capabilities of these other devices. Um, Multimedia, the ability to integrate sound and video in with the computer is absolutely coming. But a lot of people have mistaken it as the end rather than the means. Uh, we see multimedia as more, more of a means. In other words, people aren't going to buy a computer for multimedia. They're going to buy it for training or they're going to buy it for interpersonal communication. And in that communication, in addition to text, they're going to want voice. They're going to want potentially, I might want to send you a video clip. But the real market is to help us communicate better or to help us train somebody. And uh, we need to not lose sight of that. Going, um, I want to get your thoughts on the user interface stuff. And I'd like to look at the transition uh, a Xerox to Apple. Okay. When did you hear, what was your, the image of Xerox Park and what was it like when you first went in there? Um, well, Xerox Park was a, a research lab set up by Xerox when they were making a lot of profits in the copier days. And uh, they were doing some computer science research, which was basically an extension of some stuff started by a guy named Doug Engelbart when he was at SRI. Doug had invented the mouse and invented the bitmap display. And, and some Xerox folks that, that Xerox, uh, I believe, hired away from Doug or split off from Doug somehow and got to Xerox were continuing along in, these, in this vein. And I first went over there in 1979. And I saw what they were doing with uh, the larger screens, uh, proportionally spaced text, uh, and the mouse. And it was just instantly obvious to anyone that this was the way things should be. Um, and so I remember coming back to Apple thinking, our, our future has just changed. This is where we have to go. The problem was that Xerox had never made a commercial computer. This group of people at Xerox was, was, uh, was more concerned with, with uh, looking out 15 years than they were looking out 15 months and trying to make a product that somebody could use. So there were a lot of issues that they hadn't solved, like menus and other things like that. And at Apple, what we had to do was to do two things. One was complete the research, which really was only about 50% complete. And the second was to find a way to implement it at a low enough cost where people would buy it. And that, that was really our challenge. What did you su succeed in doing with the Mac? Well, the Macintosh, as you remember when it came out, we called it the computer for the rest of us. And what that meant was uh, that while experts could use some of the computers that were already out, most people didn't want, the, again, the computer was, was not an end in itself. It was a means to an end. And so most people didn't want to learn how to use the computer. They just wanted to use it. And the Macintosh was supposed to be the computer for people that just wanted to use a computer without having to learn how to use one, spent six months. Now, it turned out that the, 
the paradox was that to make a computer easier to use, you needed a more powerful computer in the first place because you were going to burn a lot of the cycles on making it easy to use. And so this computer that was easy to use was actually more powerful and could do more things than the less easy to use computer. And it took people a few years to figure that out about the Macintosh, but I think, uh, I think people did. Actually, there's a funny joke that we were clowning around one day, and one of our group is an IBM person. Uh -huh. And so he's saying, you know, some little girl walks up and sees a prompt yeah. and goes to her daddy and says, it's broken. You know, where's my desktop? Mm -hmm. You know, where's, where's my metaphor? And, and we've gotten, we've, we've adopted this new metaphor. What, how has that changed the look of computers? Well, I think, I think the Macintosh was created by a group of people who felt that uh, there wasn't a strict division between sort of science and, and art. Or in other words, that mathematics is really a liberal art if you look at it from a slightly different point of view. And why can't we interject typography into computers? Why can't we have computers uh, uh, talking to us in, in English language? And uh, looking back five years later, this seems like a trivial observation, but at the time it was cataclysmic in its consequences, and the battles that were fought to push this point of view out the door were very large. The, um, balance between thinking and doing. I mean, one of the things in the semiconductors was you had risk takers. Mm -hmm. I mean, Bob Noyce you know, learns Absolutely. to hang glide at age 40. You know? uh -huh. I mean, these people like laying their butts in the line. How important was that in the early days? I mean, we're going back to 75. Uh, well, again, after seeing... Uh, my entire life's been spent only in one industry, which is this one. And, uh, but I've been in it now for about 15 years, and I've seen a lot of people make a lot of things. I've seen a lot of people fail a lot of things. And my, my point of view on this, or my observation is, that the doers are the major thinkers. Uh, the people that really create the things that change this industry are both the thinker-doer in one person. And if we really go back and we examine, uh, you know, did, did Leonardo have a guy off to the side that was thinking five years out in the future what he would paint or the technology he would use to paint it? Of course not. Leonardo was the artist, but he also mixed all his own paints. He also was a, a fairly good chemist, knew about pigments, uh, knew about human anatomy. And combining all of those skills together, the art and the science, the thinking and the doing, was what resulted in the exceptional result. And there is no difference in our industry. The people that have really made the contributions have been the thinkers and the doers. And when you, when you, uh, a lot of people, of course, it's, it's very easy to take credit for the thinking. Uh, the doing is more concrete. But somebody, it's very easy for somebody to say, oh, I thought of this three years ago. But uh, usually when you dig a little deeper, you find that the people that really did it were also the people that really worked through the hard intellectual problems as well. What's it going to take to make computers accessible to the rest of the public? I, mean, I don't know what the statistics are, but 20 million people on computers? Or what's it going to take to get it to 100 million? Um, well, uh, you, probably death is the best invention of life yeah, because it uh, means there's a constant turnover. And so if you want to make a change in our society, uh, the best place to do it is in the educational system. So that you're, uh, there, there are now generations of people that have come out of school who computers are second nature to them. And the people in our society that, that uh, at this point still have, have not embraced these things are getting older. And as that cycle, that, that wheel of birth and death turns, uh, just like driving, people that don't drive are very rare. And another generation or two people that don't use computers are be pretty rare. Going back, it's a um, harsh way of saying it, but that's the. It's you know. very true. I mean, there's yeah. there is a line that says those people that don't adopt it will die off. Well, you know, time passes. Yeah. Um, focusing now on the third program, where we've gone from semiconductors 
And the vision is IBM is this big machine, Univac, big large machine, and we take the, the line through of integrated circuit microprocessor. And we actually got some great stuff from Ted Hoff mm -hmm. about, you know, it's, it's a light bulb. You know, you repl you, it burns out, you replace it. You yeah. know? Um, then we lead up into the beginnings of the personal computer. So what were you doing at the time, and, and how did that get started? Um. Actually, you know, it wasn't Intel that first figured out that the microprocessor was a computer. They designed these things to be used in calculators. And they thought the reason that the microprocessor came about was they thought if they could design a slightly programmable one, the next customer that walked in the door that wanted a slightly different calculator, they could just spend a few months rather than a few years designing a new piece of silicon. But I think the thought of making a computer never really occurred to them. And it was the hobbyists that thought about making a computer that thought about making a computer out of these things it was this it was the computer hobbyist community that, that first did that uh... and i don't think intel quite understood that for a few years um, but again the first thing that happened was these people came together and formed a club the homebrew computer club at stanford was the first one in the country and uh... it, it, it was a beehive of all of these people who were interested in these small little computers people that might have been ham radio operators, uh, people that might have you know, worked with large computers, uh, were all gathered together to uh, share, discuss their, uh, their latest little projects. It was very exciting. And it, there was not a month that would go by where some breakthrough didn't happen. And then the first magazine came along, which was Byte Magazine, to communicate uh, on a national scale with all of these hobbyists. So that it was a very, very exciting, dynamic time. What did you think when you saw the Apple I? What did I think when I saw yeah, the Apple I? When you first saw that, that Waz was building that, that board. Well, it didn't quite work that way, actually. Okay. What happened was, was that Waz and I uh, had known each other since I was about 12 or 13 years old. And we built, uh, our first project together was we built these little blue boxes to... Uh, make free telephone calls and uh, we had the best blue box in the world it was this all digital little blue box I don't think it works anymore so uh, but uh, we had a we had a fun time doing that so when it came to building a computer together um, was focused mostly was was the brilliant hardware engineer and focused on the core design of the computer and uh, I was worrying about which parts we ought to use and how we were going to build these things and how a, sort of a, somebody that wasn't a WAS was going to manage to buy all the extra parts you still needed to buy and plug this thing together because you still needed to buy your own keyboard and your own display and your own power supply. And, and uh, so you needed to be pretty much of a hardware hobbyist. Now we made the, a, a very important decision was to not offer our computer as a kit. Even though you needed to buy these extra parts, the, the main computer board itself came fully assembled. We were the first company in the world to do that. Everybody else was offering their little computer as a kit. And what that meant was, was there was maybe an order of magnitude more people who could actually buy our computer and use it than if they had to build it themselves. And the Apple II was actually the first computer to come fully assembled, where you didn't have to do anything. And the reason there was it was our observation that for every hardware hobbyist, someone who could either build the kit themselves or at least find these five or ten extra parts they needed, there were a thousand potential software hobbyists. And if they didn't have to do anything with the hardware except use it, make, and at that time that meant write their own programs, still there was a much larger group of people that could take advantage of this. So we wanted to reach them, and that was the, the real breakthrough in the Apple II. Contrast, if you will, the Atlantic City Fair mm -hmm. with the West Coast Computer Fair. Um, well, the, the Atlantic City uh, Computer Show was the first... I'm about to sneeze, actually. Uh, uh, so look, look at the light. <coughs> there it is. Uh, excuse me. The, um, the first face-to-face uh, -face gathering of personal computer hobbyists from all around the country was this show put on in Atlantic City in 1976. And it was in the basement of some dingy hotel. And it just happened to be about 300 degrees outside. <laughs> so the basement was, it was like a steam bath. 
and it was impossible to be down there for longer than a half an hour without being completely drenched. And nevertheless, there were a few hundred hobbyists completely drenched walking around for hours. And we had a little tiny booth there. It was, was a tablecloth over a, over, over a hotel table. And there were, th Waz and I and a friend or two of ours went there, and we had our few Apple ones there and a little poster we'd made. And that was really our first, uh, the first computer show in, in the, in the, uh, the world. A year later, I think uh, maybe, maybe even nine months later, there was the first West Coast Computer Fair, which was a much more professional operation by, com in comparison with Atlantic City, but still very, very uh, hobby-oriented compared with what goes on today. And that was in San Francisco, and there were maybe a uh, hundred uh, companies showing their wares, and it was attended by maybe a thousand people which was a lot for our industry at that time? 13,000. 13,000. Wow, really? 13,000 people. That's a lot. That's Jim Warren told me that. That's a lot. I, I'd be surprised at that, but maybe he Call knows better than that. I do. 6,000. Yeah, 6,000. Thousands of people. And um, that's when we introduced the Apple II. And uh, I think the Apple II was probably the hit of the show at that, that time. In between, you went and found McKenna. And Markula. Um, n well, we found Regis by. Um, I used to like Intel's advertising, so I called him up one day, and I said, "Who does your advertising?" And they said, "Well, Regis McKenna." And I said, "What's a Regis McKenna?" <laughs> they said, "No, no it's a person." And he gave me his phone number, and I called Regis up, and he he told us to go away about four or five times, but eventually he uh, agreed to help us out. And then Mike Markula, I found uh, from uh, a venture capitalist, actually, uh, told me that I should go talk to Mike Markula. Now, we, we hooked up with Mike just around the time we introduced the Apple II, maybe a month before. But the Apple II was, was pretty much designed and, and ready to go. And then Mike came on board, and uh, things really started to take off. How important was the disk drive? in the development of Apple? Disk drive was crucial. Uh, one of the things that people forget when they think about, about Apple, and the Apple II in particular, was that, that we were the first company to come out with a reliable, inexpensive floppy disk drive. And we had a, a low-cost floppy disk drive that really worked about two to three years before any of our competitors. And that was an incredibly important reason why the Apple II was successful. Matter of fact, uh, there were a few others. The Apple II could hold up to 48 kilobytes of memory, which today doesn't seem like much, but at that time was maybe three times as much as its competitors. And that's why VisiCalc was written for the Apple II. That it was the only computer that could hold it. And so if VisiCalc had been written for some other computer, you'd be interviewing somebody else right now. And it was because of that design decision and, and other design decisions like it that the Apple II really uh, beat its competition. How did the Apple II change the, field, the world of computing? Well, the Apple II was the world's first successful comp uh, personal computer and really defined the personal computer as we know it today. So uh, I think it, it changed the world a lot from that point of view. One of the theses is that, um, well, let me turn this question around. How important is market research? How much did you rely on it in the early days? Well, you know, I think in the early days it was very easy because you could go to a homebrew computer club meeting and there was your home market. And so you could find out what they thought. Matter of fact, you show them your product and see what they thought. And you could, you, because the products were much simpler then, and within a few months you could change it all around and come back and show them a new one. But as the market got more sophisticated, it was less easy to do that. And the problem is, is that market research can tell you tell you what your customers think of something you show them. Or it can tell you what your customers want as an incremental improvement on what you have. But very rarely can your customers predict something that they don't even quite know they want yet. As an example, no market research could have led to the development of the Macintosh or the personal computer in the first place. So there are these sort of non-incremental jumps that need to take place where it's very difficult for market research to really contribute much in the early phases of the thinking about how to, you know, what those should be. However, once you have made that jump, possibly before the products on the market or even after, is a great time to go check your instincts 
with the marketplace and, and verify that you're on the right track. And usually when you show people something, they'll, they'll say, oh my god, this is fantastic, or you know, give you some feedback along those lines. How has the personal computer changed society? I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure why I keep asking this again. I mean, how have we fundamentally changed the way we do do our do our daily business, our, our daily lives? How has it affected that? I'm not the right person to ask. Okay. Um, ask Alan Kay. <laughs> uh, to the. Uh, to the growth and the establishment of the computer industry. Uh -huh. So what did you accomplish? What did you set out to do and what did you do? Well, I think maybe something different along the lines of what you want is, um, you know, the, the semiconductor people didn't know what they had in the microprocessor for two or three years. It was the computer hobbyists that really got the idea to make this into a computer rather than a calculator. Were you out to build a com company or change the world? Uh, when we started Apple, we were out to build computers for our friends. That was all. No idea of a company. How important is a user interface in the design of a computer? Turn that into your own words. Well, the whole idea of the Macintosh was a computer for people who want to use a computer rather than learn how to use a computer. So. One way we've been playing with it is it's not how it does it, but what it does. I don't know if that's any good. In other words, I don't care how it does it anymore. I just right. wanted to do what I wanted to do. Right. There is a quote in uh, an interview that was done with me in Playboy a while ago. Where I, I, uh, I gave a Macintosh to a young kid one time. It was uh, actually Sean Lennon at his birthday. And... Uh, he had a great quote. He said, uh, he said, everyone else, and I guess I said this, actually. <laughs> oh, I think I remember. This is right. the older people and younger people. Yeah, right. right. The older people all want to know how it does what it does, but the young people just want to know what it can do. Okay, wrap that up in two. Um, is you, the, the, the group, Graphical interface or the, the, the trend, the, the line that we're going. How about this? Where are we in the evolution of the user interface? And where are we going? Is that a short one? Um, I don't know that there is a short one. But yeah. I, th this whole discussion about user interface is just strange to me because to me it's just sort of a natural thing that had to happen, did happen, and it's happened. It's kind of like automatic transmissions. Um, well, not in a history quite, series, not quite though, the same as that. But. In a history series, though, there is an, uh, an evolutionary line, so that's why we're following. Uh -huh. I mean, a lot of people don't know about Doug Engelbart, right. for example. Right. Um, okay, uh, networking. Why is networking important? Why is it the future? Well, in the 90s, we're going to revolutionize human-to-human -human communication using these desktop computers in the same way that spreadsheets revolutionized financial modeling and that desktop publishing revolutionized publishing. Great. Okay, good. Anything Thanks. we haven't covered? No, i got to go. This is great. Thank, Thank you very much. You.